And I'm Lindsay. And I'm Sarah. And together we're the co-founders of Whale Tales, a living library of cetacean stories. Today we are getting ready to go back to school and so we're recapping the summer. Plus talking about white whales. Plus, for the very first time ever, we have a story from not us. <gasps> Yay! So sit back and enjoy as we recap the summer. So before we get started, a little bit of quick housekeeping. We wanted to let you know or remind you uh, that Whale Tales has a Patreon, patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Whale Tales. And uh, if you don't know about Patreon, that is a service where you can, uh, for as little as a dollar a month, support your favorite creators like us. And we just announced a new weekly newsletter perk. So all of our patrons are now subscribed to our awesome weekly newsletter where we'll be sharing the highlights of what's been happening in the world of whale tales that week. Uh, we also wanted to mention before we get started with this summer report of sightings in BC that uh, it will not be up to date to the day that you are listening to this podcast. Um, a little behind the scenes, we are recording on August 20th. And don't forget, otherwise, you can just follow us on Facebook, uh, Whale Tales Org, for all your cetacean news and information. All right. So, it's been quite the summer. We could do a multi-day long, probably, podcast that actually went in-depth into recapping everything that's been going on, specifically along the coast of British Columbia uh, with cetaceans this summer. And we are focusing on our coast because it's where we are and we want to give our listeners the chance to kind of get to know our geography a little bit better and potentially our whales, hopefully. <laughs> Um, but we are going to keep it short and sweet because we are going to include many, many show notes this time around so that if any of the things that we're kind of recapping for the summer get you excited or jazzed and you want to know more, you can go and dig deeper into each of these things that we're going to kind of give you a summary of. The first is probably at least for me, one of the things that's most exciting that's been going on just for the last two summers here in BC, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, our federal body that looks after our waterways, um, has put together a team to survey the cetaceans along the coast. Now, they've done this periodically, but last year in 2018, they really decided to work with a number of other organizations and a number of other scientists and put together a huge two week long trip uh, to try and catalog as many individuals and species of cetacean as they could, as well as every other big thing. It's the big megafauna survey. So they went out again this summer and they had an incredible time because the grand number of species they saw, let's see, they saw fin whales and humpback whales and sperm whales and two species of beaked whales, the bairds and the cuvieres. They saw lots of orcas, bigs, as well as the residents. They saw Pacific white sided dolphins, northern right whale dolphins, Rizzo's dolphins, doll's porpoises, harbor porpoises, lots of different pinniped species, mulla mullas, shark species, but most importantly of all, not just one, but two blue whales. It was a really, really exciting and successful survey, and I think that's the big thing, is that it's, this is a multi-organization collaboration. There's researchers uh, from all over the province, actually the country, because there's some visiting researchers, as well as a couple of international ones that come on board as well. Uh, it's a huge cooperative effort, and a number of our friends of the podcast and friends of our organization were a part of it. In the show notes, we will include a link to much more detail about the survey, as well as, of course, pictures which is the best part. Um, but it is a really great way for us to sort of see what the biodiversity is like along our coast, and that seems to be doing really well. Good job, biodiversity. Good job, British Columbia. Hooray! Some of the other species that we see much more frequently and not as far away from our shores are the humpbacks and the greys. They're pretty common to see along our coastlines over the summer as they're migrating up and down from Alaska to their various breeding grounds. And they are here, 
the humpbacks in particular uh, continue their mega comeback. There have been lots and lots of sightings of humpback whales, even some larger groups of traveling humpbacks, which is exciting. Big Mama, who we've talked about previously in our podcast, is not seen with a calf this year, so fingers crossed she may be pregnant, which may be why she doesn't have a calf. Unfortunately, there have also been numerous reports of humpback entanglement, uh, particularly in fishing gear. This is happening more and more frequently, not just along our coast, but sort of in all of the areas of the world that you find humpback whales and also just larger whales in general. Uh, But the good news of this is that at least one humpback was successfully disentangled by the appropriate authorities. We cannot stress that enough. If you happen to be in a vessel and you see a whale that's entangled in fishing gear, you do not have the training. Well, unless you are someone who has the training. But if you don't (laughs) have the training to deal with that situation, please don't take it upon yourself to try and save that whale. Call the people in your area who do have that because it's a very, very dangerous situation to be in, both for the people on board trying to do the rescue and for the whale itself. So the best thing that you can do is to call whichever governing body in your part of the world takes care of that and say, hey, I got a whale, and then stay so that they can find it. That part's very helpful. Mm -hmm. And we will put our uh, link to our Animals in Distress page up, which lists as many of the numbers that we have found in our research to uh, in the different countries of where you can call websites you can visit with information about what marine animals, not just cetaceans, look like in distress and what you should do in the various situations. There have also been a lot of gray whales around on our coast, though they don't tend to be here for as long as the humpback whales, or at least they're not spotted as boisterously as the humpback whales are. The probably most publicized sightings of gray whales off our coast this summer have been unfortunately we've seen at least six gray whales have washed up along the pacific northwest coast uh, stranded and dead over the course of the summer and although necropsies are being conducted we have not yet seen any results from those necropsies. Uh, The initial assessment did show that there weren't any big ship strikes that were responsible for any of the animals that were found but from a deeper necropsy level, we still don't have any answers on that. So that's something, if we do find out, definitely stay tuned and we'll be sure to post it on social media. Yeah, there's been a lot more um, found in Oregon and also in Alaska. I think a lot of the initial reports have been um, looking more like emaciation and starvation, but no real reasons yet as to why that's happening and why that's happening all of a sudden this summer. So yeah, like Nicole said, we will keep you attuned when we find out more information. So that's a general update about all of the cetaceans in British Columbia, except for the most famous of cetaceans found in British Columbia. And that's what we wanted to devote most of our summer recap to, because we know that that's what most of our listeners are here for. Uh, So we're going to start with the uh, very famous uh, Southern Resident Killer Whales. Unfortunately, the news has been less than great this summer. So the Center of Whale Research did confirm a couple of weeks ago that three southern resident killer whales uh, are confirmed missing, most likely dead. J-17, Princess Angeline, K-25, Scoter, and L-84, Nissa. Neither, none of them have been seen in quite some time, and at least J-17 and K-25, the last time they were seen, they were seen emaciated, looking uh, thin, so they probably have not made it. So that brings the southern resident Kill whale population down to 73. We have had another strange summer of them with sightings again, similarly to last summer. We had some sightings in the end of June, and then most recently we have seen them a couple more times, I think fairly regularly in the last week or so, around the in the Juan de Fuca Strait and the Harrow Strait, so they are slowly being sighted more regularly, in August at least, um, and that has been members of all three pods. There was at least one reporting of a super pod, so they are all pretty around. And just to note, again, just because they aren't here, that means their behavior has changed, but they are still finding food. We hope. There's been lots of sightings, lots of reports of salmon um, in other places this year. And we have also had reports of the southern residents on the outside of Vancouver Island, which is a very unusual place for them to go, but they are following their food. And so that's what they're doing. So we'll see what happens. Their UBC is studying uh, Chinook this summer to see to try and study the abundance of the Chinook if it's actually 
here and they can't find them, or if the Chinook is actually, um, the population of Chinook is actually lower than we had expected, and if that is the problem. So we're not really sure what the problem specifically is in this area. We know that they feed primarily on Chinook, like 93% of their diet is Chinook salmon, and we know that they're not feeding here in the summer like they usually did. So finding out the reasons to that will hopefully help increase the Chinook population and then therefore increase the southern resident killer whale population. The good news is both new calves that have been spotted this year, L124 from L77 that was first seen in January, and J56 from J31 that was seen in the spring, um, are still around. The, I saw a little footage of J56 doing some really cute spy hops the other day. Baby killer whales, <laughs> as all of baby cetaceans don't really know how to breathe so well, so they just jump out of the air every time. It's pretty adorable. Uh, voting for the names of those two calves is now currently open. Voting closes on September 9th. We will put a link to that in our show notes. There is suggestions on the link with the name and the meaning, and you can pick which one is your favorite, and then you can email to the Whale Museum, and the winner will be announced shortly after September 9th. Yeah, so I've got the Northern Resident uh, Killer Whale Report. Um, still haven't gotten a full count of new calves, but that is because... Their research season isn't finished, so the team from the Vancouver Aquarium has been doing an aerial survey for three weeks in June and July, and they're doing a second survey, I think, as we were recording this, so we should be hearing more next month. But um, we have been getting reports that uh, A73 Springer has been seen with her two calves, at least as recently as July, and they all seem to be doing well, which is awesome. Vancouver Aquarium team uh, did a successful 32 drone flights and got some uh, amazing aerial images of approximately 80 individual whales, so um, which includes 60 northern residents, and they got 10 bigs, 15 humpbacks, and probably some other stuff too. Uh, the link for on the aquarium's website of the first report of their season is up now, and we will, on our Facebook, share the part two when it comes out next month. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I like it up there. Sorry, up there, if, if anyone doesn't know what we're talking about, I don't remember how much we've talked about northern residents, is uh, Johnstone Strait, um, the north part of Vancouver Island, where the northern residents are primarily seen. Um, and to answer your next question, big killer whales are seen all over our coast, not just down here. Uh, speaking of which, they're everywhere. <laughs> Big killer whales have been seen, uh, I think, every day this summer. That's from what I've been hearing. Um, they are just all around the Sailor Sea and uh, other parts of the Pacific Ocean, and they're having a great time killing all sorts of animals. Including big whales. Yes, including a gray whale that we was not identified. Um, it was not a gray whale we knew, but one did die, I think, in June. Um, they also make new killer whales. Because that's how it works. Um, we've had, we don't have an exact number, but over the last two years, we've had, there have been reports of at least 20 new calves uh, from Big's killer whales. And, um, which is great. They are a much larger population than, say, the southern residents. So that proportionally is much more appropriate. So as opposed to two, it's really great. And of course, one of them we're going to focus on a little bit more is t 46 B1B to look. He is the um, he is the famous killer whale that you may have seen heard about this summer. He is a leucistic killer whale. He's gray, uh, almost looks like an albino, but he's not. He's leucistic. Um, he was actually last seen. Uh, he was first seen in the sometime last fall, I think around November. But he was seen again at the end of May, and that's he's been seen fairly regularly since the T46Bs have been around the Salish Sea for quite some time. It's been seen. Lots of summer, and you are going to be hearing more about him later in our episode. Yay! Um, thanks. That was a lot of a summer report. And our summer report obviously focuses on British Columbia because that's the research and um, experience that we are most familiar with. But if you're from somewhere else and you want to share what's been going on in your waters this season, uh, you can send us an email or a comment. Uh, we'd love to hear it. You can email us at uh, info at whaletales.org or reach out to us through our website or social media. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. See what's been going on outside of BC. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've heard a couple of things about uh, the Atlantic Ocean, aside from just the right whales, um, and they've got some real cool stuff over there. So now it's time for our fun flipper fact. Fun flipper fact! 
Fun flipper fact. Fun flipper fact. It's fun flipper fact. Yeah. Um. So as I just mentioned, it was not a very long tease that you had to wait for. We're going to be talking about uh, albinism and loose system and looseism. Uh, because we are talking, uh, focusing a bit this episode on to look. So Nicole, take it away. Woo woo woo. Because everybody's favorite fun flipper fact starts with medical term definitions. Yay! No, the truth, everybody, is that albinism is very complicated. In humans, albinos do not always have red eyes. If you are a human being with albinism, there are about 14 different specific types of albinism that human beings can have. And not all of those different medical classes have red eyes. But in animals, that's basically where we net out with the definition of albinism. Uh, It does get quite complicated, and as always in the scientific community, there is much debate. But in general, we have three different terms for animals that are colored differently than you expect them to be colored. If they are animals with albinism, or if they are albinos, then they have no pigment at all in whether it's skin, feathers, scales, whatever is covering them, fur. (laughs) Um, No pigment, so they appear perfectly white. And they also have red eyes and potentially red nails. That's an animal that's albino. Uh, We are probably most familiar with this in lab rats and lab rabbits because they're inbred. And so they tend to have that gene passed along. Then for animals that are white but don't have red eyes or nails or potentially animals that are partially white, so part of their skin, feathers, scales, whatever, are missing melanin, the pigment that creates color in your exterior epidermis, whatever that happens to show up as. (laughs) Um, Those animals that are partially white or are all white but their eyes are not red, that's that's the important part here, their eyes are not red, those animals are leucistic, or they have leucism. And then, just because it's fun, and I always like to throw extra facts into our fun flipper facts, there's a third version for animals that are on the other end of the color spectrum. They're darker than they're expected to be. So they tend to appear all black, and that's called melanistic, because they tend to have extra melanin. And we're most familiar with these in the form of Black Panthers. Not the Marvel movie, but real Black Panthers, because, hey, guess what? I'm gonna ruin your life here, (laughs) or I'm gonna ruin your Jungle Book love here. There's no such thing as a Black Panther. It's not a real animal. There are melanistic jaguars or melanistic leopards, depending on what part of the world you're in, and those are Black Panthers, (laughs) right? So Bagheera, not a panther. Bagheera was probably a leopard that was melanistic. Uh, But since we're talking about cetaceans, and we did want to make Taluk our sort of star of our summer report, uh, I wanted to share with you in our fun flipper fact some of the other leucistic or albino cetaceans that have been found over the years. Probably the most famous is one of Lindsay's favorite cetaceans the world over. Megaloo! I missed him by two days. Megaloo is, I would just, I would guess, uh, the most famous uh, leucistic. We do know that Megaloo is not a true albino, um, but he's the most famous white whale. Uh, so Megaloo is a leucistic humpback whale in eastern Australia. He was first seen in 1991, I believe. He uh, is over 30 years old, and we know that he's a he because we actually have recordings of his song, which is very exciting. Uh, there are other white humpback whales that have been seen, even in eastern Australia. There's two other white humpbacks, not sure if they're true albinos or not, and lots of people like to believe that Megaloo may be their father's. Jonah. But there are also other white cetaceans that aren't just humpback whales that have been seen. In 2014, there was a true albino bottlenose dolphin. Her nickname is Angel. She was caught as part of the Taiji Dolphin Drive and is currently living in an aquarium in Japan. Um, But she is a true albino. That's Angel in 2014. And then there's also another white orca. His name is Iceberg, and he is an orca bull that was first seen in Russia in 2010 in the Bering Sea. There have been lots of other white, again, we're not always sure if they're true albinos or not, because as we've discussed, it's hard to get close enough to see the eyes of a cetacean. 
Um, but we have seen white gray whales. We've seen white heavy side dolphins. Uh, a couple of white blue whales have been seen, which is particularly fun given the color of their name. Spotted dolphins, spinner dolphins, pilot whales, and uh, just lots of things in the cetacean world. Interestingly enough, though, even though they've seen white cetaceans of all varieties, so porpoises, dolphins, whales, and we've seen white pinnipeds, seals and sea lions, there has never been a documented case of a white, whether albino or not, sea otter, or any kind of otter, actually, or dugong or manatee. So those of the marine mammal world, those species in the marine mammal world, apparently have never been documented with having this odd gene. Hmm. Interesting. And that has been your fun flipper fact, fun flipper fact, fun flipper fact about albinos. I was going to say albinos or albinism. It just <laughs> and then you couldn't together. decide. Mm-hmm. So if you want to hear more about uh, animals with anomalous pigmentation, uh, we've got a couple on whale tails. We've got two about to look so far and one about Megaloo. So that's pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. And I imagine we will have many more to look as uh, the reports from the summer trickle in. For our next fun flipper fact on our next episode of the podcast, uh, we are going to be asking our patrons on Patreon for their help in deciding what it is that we should dive deeper into and that I should sing about. So if you are already a patron, look forward to that. And if you're not, and you want to figure out how to tell me how, what to get really, really nerdy about, please consider becoming a patron just for that fact alone. <laughs> Okay, so now it's time for everybody's favorite part, except for Nicole's, who likes to sing. Um, our story of our episode, and as we mentioned, it's our first ever story that's not by us. It's by actually one of our storytellers who's been giving us stories since our inception in 2014, Ashley Keegan. So we're just going to cut to her now. She's going to tell us uh, about herself and about a couple of her encounters she had this summer. Hi, my name is Ashley Keegan. I am a professional whale watcher, a humpback researcher, and a facilitator of transient or big zorka nicknaming. So my first time meeting T46B1B, now also known as Taluk, um, was a pretty exciting day. Um, interestingly enough, my captains that day decided that uh, it should be a complete surprise to me. So one of the other boats out there got to see Taluk first. And they got really excited because, you know, here's this little gray whale. And, um, and of course, I mean, we haven't seen something like that around here, really. Uh, so, so my captains kept it a secret from me and banned me from uh, the Facebook sightings page that, that we have um uh, so that I wouldn't know what we were coming up to. So we come on scene, and of course, instantly I see this little, little gray animal, and uh, what a shock. I mean, you know, that color <laughs> just doesn't, um, couldn't stand out anymore, really. And um, so I got very excited, of course, and uh, so did my passengers, realizing that um, that I was super excited as well. I think made it um, even more uh, exciting for them, but um, it was really cool too because here's this new little calf um, that we hadn't seen before, um, or at least uh, you know I hadn't seen before, and um, with it is an even younger calf. So uh, we had uh, T46B with her newest, and uh, her daughter with, uh, with Taluk here as well. So two young calves traveling together in this, uh, rather large family group, which is always beautiful to see large groups of orca together. I quickly realized, uh, I know there was a bit of time where, uh, he was being called albino. He's definitely not albino and you could see that pretty quickly, um, he's gray and white. So there is a delineation in the color. So it made it really, um, easy to tell that he wasn't uh, full albino. He definitely has uh, more leucistic, uh, tendencies, but, uh, yeah, it was a pretty, um, incredible first encounter. Very shocking to see this animal so different from the rest of, um, of its family. Um, 
the second time I saw Toluk um, is uh, is a pretty exciting day as well. Um, that's actually the day that I found out that Toluk was a boy. Uh, so um, Toluk and um, the youngest member of um, T46B's kids, who we are still working on on nicknaming all of them, um, but that little one um, and Toluk were going crazy just trying to fly basically uh, breaching and and chin slapping and tail slapping and they were having a, a great old time while everybody else just kind of traveled around uh, uh, beside them and um, so yeah Toluk decided to uh, to do kind of an upside down uh, back dive back breach and um, I I got that lucky shot where he showed um just the right part of his belly uh, for me to be able to tell that um, that he was a boy. Um, so that was really exciting. Now, the nicknaming of Taluk was an uh, interesting process. Uh, normally, we take a little while to do it. We um, get everybody to put some names out there, put those names to a vote, um, and uh, the winning vote, you know, the, one, the, the name with the most votes wins. But in this case... Um, after the, we did this really quickly as well. We did this within just a couple of days because there was such excitement around him and, and, uh, it was a good story. Uh, so he ended up in the media very quickly as well. So we wanted to make sure that he had a, a nickname to connect the general public and, and everyone, uh, to this, this little gray whale. But the winning name, uh, which was actually Kanaka, uh, originally, uh, turned out to be maybe not the nicest, uh, nickname. Uh, turns out that that nickname has some not so nice connotations to it. And of course, after that name had won, that's when all the, um, all the backlash over the, uh, the nickname of Kanaka came out. So, we quickly put it to a vote again. Um, basically, uh, the top two nicknames, in fact, the Kanaka had won by like a single vote uh, initially. And uh, so we put it to a vote between the, if we kept Kanaka, uh, regardless of the negative connotations, you know, there are a lot of place names uh, around this area that, that are called Kanaka. Um, so, the, you know, we wanted to to see if if we wanted to keep Kanaka or if we wanted to change it to the second place winner, uh, which was Toluk. So we re-voted and uh, Toluk ended up being the winner. Uh, So there was a little bit of confusion pretty quickly um, between the nicknames. And I know a lot of people um, that uh, maybe not quite uh, inside the nicknaming group or weren't paying as close attention to the nicknaming group um, were confused for a little bit but um, yeah now he is uh, officially uh, nicknamed Taluk and um, it is the uh, Bellicula Coast Salish word for moon he's you know this gray little whale and um, so yeah somebody uh, sounds like it was actually a passenger of uh, one of the companies out here um put that name forward and so uh somebody one of the naturalists uh from the company put that forward to us and it ended up being the winning name after all uh so it's pretty nice when everybody gets a chance to to participate in the nicknaming of these guys one of the things that was also interesting uh with Taluk in the first few encounters was that everybody noticed right away that he had all of these rake marks on his body, these orca teeth marks on his body. Um, and there was uh, some thought that maybe he might have some some problems with his eyes or something like that because every time you saw his face come out of the water, he was um, either squinting or his eyes were closed. And, um, you know, out out there when it's sunny, you know, a lot of times when orca do surface, you 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 don't see their eyes open, um, but it's a little bit harder to tell because they're so dark in color. Um, and same with the rake marks. You know, this animal might you know have a, a tendency to get picked on more. A lot of leucistic animals are, but what's interesting is a lot of orca out here have, especially um, the transients, do have a lot of rake marks on their body. Some are more obvious than others, and and some don't have as many um, as others. And it could just be that 
he's a very rambunctious little guy and, you know, maybe gets in trouble more than some of the others. Um, it's hard to say for sure, but, uh, I don't, I don't know that he's, um, he's got an excessive amount of, ex amount of extra, uh, rake marks on his body. Although some people would disagree for sure. Um, but, uh, he is an interesting little whale and, uh, really special character, um, in our area. So, um, I think everybody is really excited to see this animal, uh, grow up and see, you know, how his color may evolve. If it stays, uh, a darker gray, if it lightens up or, um, or if it darkens up, you know, he's, uh, he's definitely a, a mystery and we're all looking forward to seeing this little animal grow up. And that's my story. I love Ashley. Thank you so much, Ashley, if you're listening, for sharing that story with us. Uh, and if you, our other listeners, would like to share a story with us, we do have now a new way for you to submit them. You don't just have to go to our website or send it to us on social media. You can do what Ashley did. You can actually just record yourself telling your whale tale and then uh, send it to us as a voice memo attached to an email. And we could feature you on the podcast if you would like to be featured. It's a great way for us to gather new stories and a great way for us to share your story with our podcast audience yeah very exciting sweet so as we are wrapping up the episode we wanted to sort of wrap up the summer and talk about back to school so i love back to school i think we're all big back to school fans <laughs> um so for our um tales of saving whales call to action this month uh, we figured we'd theme it around back to school. So I always, even though it's been a long time since I've gone back to school in September, I always treat September as kind of like other people's like New Year's. Like I don't really do New Year's resolutions, but September's always been that time of the year where I'm like more likely to decide to make a change or start um, start a new project or something like that. So um, even if you're not going back to school, there's hopefully some stuff in here that might apply. So obviously when you go back to school, you need school supplies. And first of all, that can be really expensive. And also if you're like ordering them all over the place or driving all over the place, um, it can be um, pretty uh, wasteful or impactful for the environment. So I wanted to share um, what we did uh, when I was a kid, because uh, I thought it was kind of a cool idea that um, we would basically at the, I don't know exactly when we did it. And like, we weren't super crazy about it in terms of organization, because that's not really how my family worked, but just like there were three of us kids and we would like at the end of the year or sometime in the summer or maybe it was when it was time to start thinking about school supplies, we'd like figure out what school supplies we had in the house. So like everybody would like clean out all their drawers for like pens and erasers and notepads and whatever, put everything together and then be like, okay, do we need any more glue sticks? No, we have 47 glue sticks because we bought a box of them at Costco. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So we basically go shopping in our existing school supplies and then figure out what else we actually needed to get. So yeah, just a good suggestion for all of us, whether going back to school or not, like going through what you have or also like going through like pooling with your friends. Like, hey, I bought too many notebooks, Sarah. Would you like one? And I will say yes, because <laughs> I have a problem. <laughs> And then the other thing that back to school makes me think about, and this is a good time of year for anybody to sort of reassess your transportation plan. So um, I think we all are pretty aware that how we get around uh, commuting to and from work or school or whatever we do has a lot of impact in the world around us, both in terms of pollution, but also honestly just in terms of quality of life and traffic and how you enjoy your and explore your city from where you live. So I just figured I'd throw it out there that like this is a great time of year to think about how you get to and from the places you need to go and if you want to maybe try changing it up um september we usually have pretty good weather here at least in vancouver so it's like a good time of year to try like walking or biking or taking the bus or taking a different bus yeah it's just like a good time of year to try shaking things up a bit Mm -hmm. And remember that everything ca uh, counts. So even if you take the bus once a week, yeah, that's still a big change. And also, for those of you heading back to school, um, the buses on the first week of school are, at least for university, are crazy busy. But the second week, uh, way less busy because people decide to not go to their 8 a.m. classes. 
<laughs> that is a good point. And like, if you're trying out a new bus route, especially if you're anywhere near a college or a university, like, and it's packed, maybe try it the second week rather than the first week if you're not a student. I think that brings us to the end of our episode. Um, as always, we'd have the What You Can Do page link in our show notes. You can also find it on our website under Tales of Saving Whales. And it's just a really great list of small things you can do every day to help cetaceans and marine life and the planet. You can find all of that info and more on our website at whale-tales.org, including our merch, our Patreon, with our new newsletter perk, woohoo, our podcast subscription link, and over 600 whale, dolphin, and porpoise stories. You can also head to our site to share your stories. Remember, it's not a big deal, it's not scary, and you don't have to be an expert. If you've seen a cetacean, we would love to hear about it, and we would love to add your story to our library. So you can click the share link on our site, contact us on social media, or email us a voice memo to tell us all about your incredible cetacean encounter. So that's whale-tales.org. Tales like the story, not like the animal. Uh, Thanks again for listening and for supporting us, and we'll be back on the last Wednesday of next month with more fun facts, stories, and super nerdy trivia. Thanks, everybody, and have a whaley great day.